engage, we have this weekly office hours session. In the interim, if you have questions that come up, please use GitHub discussions. We go through and triage that. And so we'd love to be able to hear any questions or any uh, issues you may come up with in the meantime as well. We also have on uh, every other week rotating basis development uh, office hours for both Python and Java as well. And so this week we'll have our Python from 9 to 9.30 and then the following week Java as well. And so if you are interested in helping out or diving even deeper into either of those languages, feel free to join those as well. So a couple of just quick announcements before we dive in. We have a couple of new blogs that I'll put the link to the blog in after I'm done sharing as well. But there's a new blog around introducing Python functions and a bit of change that we have in now choice behavior and being able to change that as well. And so the blog details out all of the changes, any impact it may have to as well, and that update there. And then we also have a great customer case study from Prezi that details how they've gone through their AI journey, how they've brought in semantic kernel as well. And so if you haven't had a chance to read through, it gives a lot of great information and insight as well. And then just as always, wanted to remind everyone, if there's anyone who hasn't been on for the last couple of weeks, so we've gone through a docs update. And so within that, we have updated graphics. It's really focused around concepts and being able to go through and start with agents build from there as well. And so if individuals haven't had a chance to check that out, I would recommend that. And with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to questions individuals may have. Feel free to raise your hand or put them in chat as well. Uh, you mentioned the behavior if you haven't tried this out this is a little bit more of a advanced kind of uh, capability um because if you use automatic function calling it kind of send a chat decide the function kind of do that loop over and over again to say turn on the light bulb if you need something more deterministic if you're like hey the, uh, you must you must call a function uh, and really what you're using the ai for is to slot them into these these functions to figure out what the parameters are. Um, that can be a good use of the, the choice behavior stuff that was blogged about. Does anyone have any questions on that as well? If they've either had a chance to look at the blog or just questions about that as well? Perfect. I'm just putting the link to the docs and all up blog in the window now. But um, looking through, is there any other questions folks may have? Feel free to come off of mute. We'd love to dive into questions you may have. Also, give some updates. I think. Um, uh... A few weeks ago, we mentioned that we are working on updating our Azure OpenAI connector to use the 2.0 version that Azure is creating for Azure OpenAI. That work is getting close to uh, wrapping up. I believe Mark is the plan like next week at the earliest that that would go live. Um, it will have a few breaking changes. Uh, but this will be very different than what <laughs> last November and December looked like, where you had to basically rewrite your, your entire code base. Um, basically, because the uh, Azure OpenAI SDK is, is changing so rapidly, um, what we're going to be asking customers to do is just a few name changes in their programs. So some of the import statements, your using statements, uh, some of the classes have like slightly subtle different names. Uh, so we'll be giving a, a very detailed step-by-step -step guide on what needs to be changed. Hopefully we can give you some really creative uh, regex patterns for uh, control F and replace. 
And uh, we'll also have a bunch of the PRs on how we have to update our own samples uh, that you'll be able to reference. Mark, is there anything I'm missing? No, I think you've you've covered it well. Like you know, I mean, this is, um, you know, this this change is is basically being um, kind of forced on us because of the um, new OpenAI SDK and the Azure AI OpenAI SDK is being rebased on top of that. So we're inheriting all of these changes. Um, we're, we're hoping that for if you're just using our our services, our AI services directly. The changes will be very, very minimal. If you're doing any kind of breaking glass type scenarios where you're using anything from the underlying SDK, then you'll have to just basically um, pivot to use the um, um, the latest classes, like you know. But 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 this is this is really good because it puts us um, on top of all the very latest um, SDKs, and um, and then it'll allow us to keep completely up to date with any changes that come from OpenAI. So kind of going forward, we should have. Um, you know, very early adoption of all the, their latest and greatest APIs, you know, so, yeah. What I'm, what I'm probably most excited about is uh, um, our agents framework is still using Assistance V1. There's a V2 API um, that will also come as part of this move to uh, this updated SDK. And if you have any questions or concerns, uh, definitely let us know. Perfect. I'm seeing a hand. If you want to go ahead and come off of mute, we'd love to hear from you. Um, hey, Matthew. Hi. Um, so I had a quick question. As you mentioned, agents. Um, so the the doc, it doesn't really have any example uh, or doesn't really talk about using agents or defining agents. But I see the repo already has uh, some agent code in it, which is like an agent class that I can probably use. So is that something that's still in works? Um, or could we just go ahead and define agents? Like what's happening there? There is some yeah, updates yeah, yeah. that are so going to be coming. Oh, go for it, Matthew. Oh, yeah, you, you go first. Sorry. So there's a couple of updates that we'll be having around agents. There's a blog and uh, subsequent docs updates in the works as well that's going to go through the framework and go through that in a bit more depth as well. And so that is something that, though you're seeing items in the repo, will be coming as well um, in a short time, but you can uh, start to use that in the interim as well. Matthew, anything else from your end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we are planning on moving to the doc. The reason they haven't been in the doc so far is it has been fairly experimental. Um, it's now at the point where it feels like it's getting stable enough that uh, we can get more folks using it and giving us even more feedback. Um, if you want to check out our samples, you want to give it a whirl, um, we've been getting good feedback from first party teams that have started using it. Uh, and I know a couple of you on this call have. Uh, message me and Sophia on the side on what should and shouldn't change. Um, so yeah, definitely play around with it. And then just as a another kind of FYI, if you're interested in seeing what's coming next with it, kind of what a roadmap is for agents, we do have our uh, uh, GitHub projects board where we've stacked ranked all of the things on the agent space. I'll go ahead and show that with y'all real quick. Um, so you can see a lot of the things that we've labeled as the P zeros um, are uh, either in review or or nearing done. Uh, we have one last thing, which is streaming. This is probably the biggest ask that we have left for our agent framework. Once all of these P zeros are in, um, that's when we'll really start encouraging folks to start using it uh, in enterprise scenarios. Um, and you can kind of see what what else is planned for us uh, moving forward. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, yeah, really sure. looking forward to this. Yeah. That would be great. Great. Other questions? I'm seeing we have a hand up if you want to go in and come off of mute. Hi. Yeah. Um, kind of maybe a simple question. I'm not sure. Are prompt functions, when you register them with the kernel and like they're invoked, are they treated as tools? Like any other, like a native function, like, you know, function calling, it turns on that JSON spec, gets sent to the LLM. So prompt functions as well are treated like tools, are they? 
they if you register with them with the kernel, yes, uh, they're treated like any other tool. Yeah, um, you don't have to register as in, in the kernel. It's like if you're just you just need to get a prompt and flop fill with a bunch of parameters. Um, I would just use it on its own and they are done. Uh, but yeah, if you want to, if you add it to the kernel, we add it as a tool and the LM can then call it if it decides it wants to use it. So in that case, how is like the system prompt and user prompt split up? Because then it's all just like one giant blob, right? So like, if, if from the LLM's perspective, let's say I'm using like OpenAI, it has like a separate field in the actual API spec for system prompt, or at least that's like one explicit message. And then the next message is going to be like a user prompt. So how does that actually get split up? Um, so, just, so let me try to connect it with the first question. So if you, if you build a prompt, maybe it's like you are a, uh, you will write the really eloquent email and here's all the guidance and here's, uh, the subject and who it's supposed to be written to. Those are like input parameters. Mm -hmm. When you add that to the kernel and it becomes a tool. The, the next AI that uses it as like a tool call, what it will see is a function called craft eloquent email, and it takes in the input parameters of subject and who it's supposed to be written for. So it, it looks like a function at that point. Right. The AI doesn't realize it's a tool. Now there's a second question that you had, which is, okay, there's these, these different types of message types that uh, have these different types of roles. The um open ai apis make it really easy as, as you mentioned i think they have like this special thing for like a system prompt and then you can have like uh other messages um you do not have to just have a system prompt at, at the top you can actually have a system prompt multiple times within your uh within your your prompt what mm. i personally like to do is I'll have a system prompt at top saying, hey, you are a friendly assistant. It's kind of that persona e type stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have the standard user assistant, user assistant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the very end, if I want to really force the AI to behave a certain way, maybe I really want it to generate JSON, or I really want it to perform a function call, or I really want it to do X, Y, Z, then I'll have a final system message uh, that has those instructions. Um, so that's just a call that you can have multiple of these things all over the place. You don't have to be super locked in if you don't want to. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I, well, I I just wanted to know though, like what the default behavior is. So even if like you have like a conversation summary plugin, um, I just want to know what happens. Like that's one of the examples you guys have. I just want to know what happens when that tool is invoked. What does the actual message structure look like? I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand exactly what's getting sent to the LLM. Um, but, but I mean, I I can probably look into by just putting a breakpoint and seeing, like how exactly that structure is passed. Um, yeah, I would I, I would do that. Yeah, okay. the okay. if you if you look at the how the API actually sends things over the wire, it's like this JSON object with an array of messages. Mm -hmm. And each message has like the role and the text inside of it. Right. Um, if you use something like the conversation summary plugin, it takes a bunch of those messages and just squashes it down. Okay. Um, I believe I want to believe that it turns into like a user message or something. I it this is fuzzy for me. Um, okay. But yeah, it, yeah, it just collapses it down into okay. one message. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Great other questions folks may have. I'm not seeing anything in chat. Feel free to come off of mute. Great, we have a hand if you want to come off of mute. Hi, um, I have kind of a follow-up question on the agent and persona idea. Um, so what my understanding is an agent is a plugin, a persona, and a planner. And so all three of those things, it seems like can be in a kernel also. So I was wondering what the difference is between an agent and a kernel. Great question. So, and just to clarify, 
we like to say uh, an agent is like all three of these things combined. Uh, persona, like what what is this agent's like role in life? Uh, plugins, what is this tools? What can it do? And some sort of like planning logic so that it can do all these different things. Um, you can build, and I think I think we say this in the doc. So you can basically build an agent without using our agent class, just using a kernel, right? Load in some okay. prompts, you create a chat history with like your, your persona, and you start a back and forth chat and you can call your functions. Great, cool, whatever. Because that is such a common pattern, because we suspect people are going to be having to write this code like hundreds, if not thousands of times, there is then value to say, okay, instead of having everyone write the same code every single time, we will create a new thing called an agent that starts to encapsulate some of that logic and reduce some lines of code. And most importantly, has a very defined contract of how it receives messages and sends messages back out. So you're, you're totally on point. Like these things are very, very similar. Uh, and what we are trying to provide is really just a, a, a little helpful wrapper to one, reduce the amount of code that you're writing. And then two, make it easy for these agents to actually collaborate and work with each other. Um, because otherwise you would have to be the one that defines those contracts of how these agents talk to each other. We want to provide that value for you. Yeah, okay, thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Yeah, go So for it. looking at the Autogen or Microsoft Autogen and Back in February, there was an article, the difference between semantic kernel and autogen is autogen is multi-agent and semantic kernel is single agent. And I've seen agent samples now, you know, where they're having conversations with each other and you have multiple agents. So I was wondering, what is the vis continued vision for that of the difference between those two? How do they work together? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's probably worth, before you even describing like, what is the functional differences? Like, the differences in philosophy, like why they were both built. So okay. Autogen was built for, from the Microsoft Research Department, it's about figuring out what are the best patterns for these multi-agents that talk to each other. Because of that, they have a bunch of what they call, I believe it's called workflows of how these different agents like communicate, whether it's a group chat, hierarchical, workflow, like whatever it might be. But they're not prioritizing things like Oh, we need to make sure we have open telemetry. We want to make sure you have hooks for responsible AI, yada, 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 yada. Semantic kernel does care about the enterprise pieces because we are the enterprise SDK for AI, for Microsoft, and other parties like yourself. And so that does mean in some places we are going to be a little bit slower, right? Because we're going to be focusing on uh, developing those telemetry features or those hook features, right? Uh, we also mm -hmm. like for research to get settled. <laughs> if we build something and then we go, oh no, we built it wrong. We have to do a breaking change and, and anger a bunch of people, right? Um, and so what I, what I would say is the, the research that Autogen has done is starting to solidify, which is why you're now starting to see us basically replicate most, if not all those patterns into semantic kernel with the goal being of, we know folks like yourself want multi-agent, we see how popular Autogen is. And so what we want to do at Microsoft is provide an enterprise grade version of that so that um, uh, you can deploy these things at scale, rest assured that you have the observability and responsible AI needs that, that you have. Okay, thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Perfect, thank you for the um, question, course, Rachel. Yeah. You can, of course, use these things together, um, but hopefully once our stuff is done, uh, you won't need to. And then at that point, the main value of Autogen is they're going to keep pumping out research on figuring out how these different agents can work together. And as the research gets formalized, we'll bring in the semantic kernel. Sounds good. Thank you. Hey, Arvin, do you want to go ahead and come off of mute? Hi. <clears throat> So is um, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Is there any new uh, or update on the on the pro the kernel memory project? Because we are still looking for a solution for a programmatic uh, ingestion of documents into a vector store, and these documents may have you know 
uh, scanned, be scanned faxes, etc. So the pipeline needs to have you know facility for OCR, etc. Yeah. So um, a lot of people are using it uh, so much so that uh, uh, it is now this nice little jewel that we, <laughs> we have in the office of the CTO. That's kind of the the org that. Samantha Kernel lives in and, and the, this memory project lives in. Um, so we are hoping to get it a home. Right? Um, so we're, we're shopping around to a few different product teams within Microsoft uh, and see if we can get uh, a proper owner so that I can continue getting support and more importantly, uh, production enterprise support. Uh, so as if, if and when that happens, we'll kind of report back and uh, ensure that news. Um, but in the meantime, we'll, we'll probably continue with our current statement. Hey, it's a project. If you are comfortable using it, which a lot of people are, great. If not, uh, it's just another open source project. Um, but at least in the .NET ecosystem, it's like the thing um, when it comes to ingesting documents for your RAG scenarios. Um, so yeah, keep keep using it if it's it's working for you, and hopefully in a few weeks, month, time, we'll have some good news on uh, its long-term supportability. Okay, thanks. Great, other questions folks may have. Great, Ankar, um, do you wanna come off of mute? Yes. Um, so just um, you know, we we've had this discussion recently um, while we were talking about agents internally, and one of the things that came up was this idea of agents having um, you know agents being made up of kernels, plugins, uh, memory, um, and all this stuff. So the um, on the plugin side, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is would each agent so I know I have I have a plugin class, and when I say import import a plugin, what SK does is it's going to create those kernel functions and store them or add them to the kernel. So if I have multiple agents, and if each agent let's say loads like a utility plugin, does that mean I have like two copies of that plugin in my memory? Like how I'm trying to think of this from a memory footprint perspective. Mm -hmm. um, is there some work happening on that side wherein when once you have like a large number of plugins, how do you avoid you know loading like same plugin twice into the memory? Is there something happening there? Uh, okay, so if you if you get this complex, actually Mark came off the call. Maybe <laughs> if you want to try answering this one, I think I know the answer, but you probably do better at it. <laughs> yeah. So 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 what you should be able to to do or what you can do is just load your plugins. Um, we, we've actually um, like load them from a type or lo load them from open API. Um, we've put in some new methods actually. There's a new release of semantic kernel that went out yesterday and there's some new methods where you can load open API um, plugins without having a kernel instance. So you can do that once and then um, every time you create a kernel instance, you can basically just add the um, the plugins to it. Um, but you only have one instance of the the plugins loaded, and they can be shared across multiple um, kernels. So um, if you run into any issues with with this approach, yeah, let us know. Sorry, go ahead, Matthew. And this is with the there's like a plugin factory class, is that right, Mark? Um, yeah, yeah. There's a kernel plugin factory, and there's an open API kernel plugin factory, which just went in yesterday. Great. And so yeah, oh, you should be able to use those things to yeah to create these things. It's not, I would say it's it's like internal plumbing for semantic kernel, but uh, it's there for these more complex or uh, these optimization scenarios that you're describing. Okay, that's pretty interesting because um, we actually implemented our own plugin factory, but um, but it seems like this, this one, um, comes with the advantages of not being able, it gives us advantage of having those like plugins just loaded once. Like we don't have to add them to multiple kernels. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can create them independently. They can float in the ether, and then uh, what I'll do is I'll then inject them into whichever kernels that I want. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I had another question if no one else has. Um, it's uh, on a different topic. So one of the things that uh, I've seen is, so when I add plugin functions, if I make the plugin function description uh, vague, um, you know, the, uh, the model is not very good at choosing the right set of functions that I want it to do to achieve a goal. Um, but if I make it more specific, uh, you know, I just like make it detailed as to what exactly that function does. I actually require a very detailed prompt to be able to um, call that function in the sense that, um, you know, I'm trying to, let's say, get three or four functions called together. I would have to like have a very detailed prompt so that the model knows that this is the exact function that we're talking hmm. about. It seems like seems like there's a trade off and um, and the way things are structured, um, at least for us, it's um, the, the plugin functions seem to be atomic units uh, that that do you know atomic units of work. So these are functions that do atomic units of work. But then a plugin defines these atomic units of work, but but there seems to be some lack of knowledge on part of the LLM where it doesn't really know the workflow to be able to handle these to together. be able to invoke right. these functions and that's the piece i'm still trying to figure out if there's uh, there's patterns you're aware of where this idea of a workflow could be um could be you know introduced to the uh, <laughs> So you, you have all these atomic things and you almost have like to have like some level of expertise to actually know how to wire them up. And what you're looking for is like, where, <laughs> where should I provide this expertise? My guidance is like what we call persona or the system prompt, um, especially if you're going this like multi-agent route, when you create this specific agent and when you give it these very atomic functions, also give it a system prompt that says, hey, this is how these things interact and how you use them together. And if here's an example of a very vague user question, how you call these three things in, in, in sequence. I think that will help. That kind of touches on the workflow pieces. There's also research being done of if you have a more prescriptive workflow, like almost like a finite state machine, how can you walk an agent from one step to the other? That's still early so you can see that uh autogen has the flavor of this lang graph has kind of the flavor of this semantic kernel over the summer will be doing some investigations around this but i think for your immediate need um just updating the system prompt with some of this guidance should be should be sufficient i see um um sure and then i guess one other uh recommendation i i too have noticed that if you give an agent a bunch of very like atomic things and for other folks on the call when i say atomic i typically mean like create read update write, like very like very like every entity in the world will always have like crud operations right i find the lms don't perform very well on those because they almost have to be a little bit too creative like um what's a good example a good example is i, I always like my light bolts if I give it an update query for like any of the properties inside of the light bulb and I say, hey, turn on and off, the current elements are pretty good at using update to turn it on and off, but it's having to do a lot more work than if there was just like a function that said turn on and off the light bulb, right? Um, if you can make the functions more scenario specific, if you can make the functions names more aligned to what like a, a real human is going to describe, a lot of times the LM is able to better pick it. What this probably means is you'll have more functions, but they'll do more things and they'll be more aligned with what the user wants. And so it, it's a bit counterintuitive, but the AI will actually have an easier time taking the user's messages and mapping it to one of those higher order functions that then in and of itself is probably having a bunch of like uh, atomic functions being being run. 
Uh, so that's just one other bit of recommendation. You might want to experiment based on the types of queries users are giving your system. Can you create these higher order functions that are easier for the LM to understand? Yeah, we, we've, we, we've looked into that approach. So for us, that approach works well when my, the sequence of steps that I'm trying to follow is solely comprised of native functions. And as soon as I yep. need to invoke a prompt function in between, um, that's when that approach like falls apart. Um, because I, I might, I might have, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was going to say you, within a native function, you should be able to just like spin up a prompt and invoke it and get the result. So maybe that works for, for your needs, but maybe, maybe it, I don't quite understand your scenario enough, but um, from a technical perspective, that, that should be possible. Yeah, maybe, um, yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll probably just explore that approach more. I, I think one of the samples that you have, which talks about kernel combinations, right? There's this test slash sample example, which basically creates a pipeline using existing functions. I, I, I think that's probably, um, that's on the that's more something like something more that we would want to do but I, but um yeah we don't get it off the uh <laughs> right away so we just have to um, build more on that it's going back to this idea of you know you know just having llm having this idea of persona the, the reason uh, having the idea of a workflow the, the 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 lens i'm looking at from is from a plugin author perspective so when an author writes a plugin um I don't mm -hmm. I don't really want them to know anything about inner workings of SK. All I want them to care about is those atomic units of work that the AI has to do. And perhaps today what this plugin class, it doesn't really have any description or function or you know any sort mm -hmm. of text. And maybe plugin is some place that can probably put it together. That I mean that's something that would interest us more or solve our problem in a lot better way. Um you know, just like yep. giving yep. plugin no, authors totally the freedom to, yeah. Because basically what you're asking for is like, today when we create all these functions and we give them to the L and there's like this function payload, if there is then a description at the plugin level, we could take that and theoretically put it in a system prompt. So that as you, to your point, it's then the responsibility of the plugin author to do the, prompt engineering work to make that description as good as possible so that if it is imported by six different agents, they all get the same description instead yes. of having to like run to each of these six agent authors going, please ask them the description so my plugin works. Is that more or less right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, uh, I think this is a new ask that I haven't seen before. Uh, if you don't mind creating an issue for us on our GitHub, uh, it'll just make it a little bit easier for us to track it. And then sure, we know yeah. who, who to reach out to <laughs> as we make, make proposals. Absolutely, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Thanks. Perfect. Thank okay. you for the questions. Other questions folks may have. I'm not seeing anything in chat. Feel free to come off of me if you have other questions. I guess this is just like a quick ish one. Um, one thing I was looking at is just getting the prompt template, like using function filters to get the prompt template text. I was just trying to do some of my own more deep ingrained logging um, and trying to find the best place to add logging without obviously changing the actual SK code base. So I wanted to get like the, the template. That's why I was also asking about the system prompt and user prompt earlier for tool calls. Because mm. I just want to have like as deep introspection as possible where I know exactly what prompt function was called, but then I also know exactly what the LLM saw. And I can ideally mm -hmm. understand that through some step of the prompt function's execution lifecycle rather than logging it at the like client LLM client level. Because once it's at the LLM yep. client, I don't actually know what process triggered it. But 
if I, I that's what I was trying to do with function filters, but we found that it wasn't simple to get the template because it's like private. Um, we do have another filter. Uh, I think we have Demetro on the call. Um, yep. What is it called? Prompt render filter. Yeah, that's correct. Prompt. So, are you interested in rendered prompt, or are you interested in actual template that were that was? So, used what, for this? ideally, what I could get, um, for lack of a better way to put it, is everything. So, I want to get the arguments that I pass. I want to get the template, and then I want to get the rendered prompt as well. So, okay, that so way we I know have... exactly what happened. Okay, so we do have uh, kernel arguments, an object in filter context. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we... We do have, um, so for render prompt, you can use function result uh, in the context. So if you say context dot function result uh, dot render prompt, you will be able to get uh, render prompt. And for the actual template, I'm not really sure that is available uh, today. Uh, but if that will be useful for you, um, I think there should not be a problem uh, to add it. Although uh, I can see that this pro property will be probably nullable because uh, it will be applicable only for the uh, you know semantic functions, but not native functions because uh, prompt is not related to, to native functions, right? Um, so yeah, if you actually yeah, I, I think we have like we already have kind of logging for template and for actual rendered prompt. So I would probably suggest to investigate like um, current logging, which we current like which we have, and then maybe it will cover your scenario. And if okay. not, then you can create GitHub issue with your specific case. We will uh, you know uh, take a look and uh, see what is the possible way to get this information for you. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if function filters could be used because we already are using those a little bit, and it yeah. had the context object was almost had everything we were looking for. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. I guess the, to Dimitro's point, have you had luck using the out of the box telemetry? Like, I'm so now I, I'm curious. Like, is it missing something that that you need, which is why you're building your own telemetry that that we should just bake into the 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 um we were because we use the function. So we, I looked at the logging library and like where it's passed. But because we were using the function filters and I saw that context object, I was just like, oh, this is easy. I'll just take all the information from this because mm -hmm. this is what I was looking for. Um, it sounds like maybe I should try out the logging library a little bit more. Um, but, or sorry, the, log, it, the if, uh, telemetry. If yeah. anything, yeah, if anything, just to give us feedback. <laughs> uh, because it sounds sure. like y'all have started doing some more advanced things on your telemetry needs for reporting or observability. Right. Um, and so y'all might have already started logging things that we haven't uh, and just getting that awareness so that we can just bake it in natively into the system would be good. Gotcha. Yeah, we want to be super, super like it, detailed with how we have like incur cost. So we want to understand it from mm, like, mm. the application level. So like user prompt comes in, we do all this cool stuff how much cost was incurred per step, per entire workflow, per type of workflow. We're trying to get a really good idea of how much these are costing us. So that's why that's why I'm looking for these kind of things. But it sounds like maybe I should look more into oh. the telemetry piece. What, well, and I could see the benefit of having now the pre-rendered prompt and the render prompt, because then you could split out the token usage between Hey, this is how much we're paying for the template, and this is how much we're paying for the dynamic. Exactly. Input. So, what is "quote unquote" dead weight? I don't want to say dead weight in the sense that templates aren't useful, but you, you, what is always being dragged or included every time I send this? Because you can have such an innocuous, yeah. tiny user prompt, and it has like a huge, huge uh, system <laughs> prompt you don't ever see. And we actually we we saw yeah. that when we first started trying to do this logging. So that's why this is very important to us. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't I feel like there's this whole set of user stories around token counting and figuring out what's causing latency and cost uh, that we need to bake into our, our existing telemetry. So, yeah, if, if you're able to, if you feel comfortable sharing those scenarios as a GitHub issue, 
Um, I know personally, I'd love to bake those things natively into Semantic Kernel. Sure thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll look a little bit more into the telemetry that we have and maybe have a bit more detailed uh, issues for the gaps if I see any. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there's a few questions in the chat on um, telemetry. We do have a sample that kind of walks through into end what we have. Let me see if I can get that dug up. And then while you're um, pulling that up, a lot of we're also... Oh, go for it, Matthew. Oh, if, um, most of our telemetry is based off of the make sure I get this right, open telemetry semantic conventions for AI, which is what the industry is kind of aligning to for all LLM calls. Uh, so I would also start expecting that if you use semantic kernel, your uh, telemetry reporting tool of choice that uses open telemetry, they should start providing out of the box reporting or graphs or visualizations for all of this AI telemetry that we're uh, starting to generate. Sorry, Sophia, take it away. Oh, yeah, no worries. On the docs front as well, there's some updates that should be coming to telemetry as well. They'll have some additional details there as well on top of the sample that Matthew put in chat. Thank you. Great. Other questions folks may have? If there are no other questions, then we'll go and wrap up today's office hours. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much.